So this video is kind of one of those off the record proofs uh, where we will be showing uh, two results. One result is that we will try to show that the total claim amount uh, given in of t, that this thing, uh, the mean of the total claim amount given in of t is equal to n of t multiplied by the mean of x1. And the other thing we will try to show is that the variance of the total claim amount given n of t is just equal to n of t multiplied by the variance of x1, where we recall that s of t is the sum of claims from 1 up to n of t, which is the number of claims at time t, and also that we assume that the claims are iid, and in particular, they are independent from the claim number process. So just uh, to get us started, I've written up a couple of conditional expectation rules in the side here. And basically, these are the only rules that you really need to work with conditional expectation. You just have to get used to them. Uh, so the first thing that I've written up here is that if x and i are independent stochastic variables, then the mean value of x uh, does not change when you get information about y. So the conditional expectation of x given y is just equal to the expectation of x. Now, on the other hand, if I have any x and y that need not be independent, then the mean value of some function of x multiplied by some function of y conditioned on y, that is equal to me just taking the f of y outside of the conditional expectation. And this is called taking out what is known. And this rule is going to be used quite a lot. So I'll just write here, taking out what is known. The next rule we will use is that conditional expectation is linear. And that means that if I take the mean value of a linear combination of stochastic variables given something, then it's the same as taking the conditional expectation inside the linear combination. So uh, linearity here is also something that we will use. Uh, so I'll also just write that name here. And one last thing is the thing that we call the double expectation property. Uh, some also call it a special case of the tower property. Uh, others just call it, well, the definition of a conditional expectation. So if you take the expected value of a conditional expectation of y given z, for example, then this is just the same as the expected value of y. So, so the inner thing here, this is a stochastic variable in the sense that z can take on different values. And according to the different intervals that z lies inside, then the mean of y, given that z lies inside that interval, will take on a number, the value of a number. Uh, but however, before we decide which values z takes, z is stochastic, and therefore the mean value of y given z is also stochastic. Uh, and when we take the expectation outside of this inner stochastic variable, then what we get again is the mean value of y. So now we have established the rules of calculation, uh, and we will start calculating. Uh, let's start by considering the first one here, which is the mean value of the total claim amount given n of t. Now, what can we do with this? One of the first things we can do is acknowledge the fact that we're not really that comfortable with something stochastic up there in the symbol. We have no rules that tell us how to work with this yet. So therefore, let us write this sum in another way. We look at it and realize that, in fact, we can just let the sum go to infinity and take the bound with n of t inside as an indicator, where we require that the k's have to be smaller than equal to n of t before this indicator is 1. 
so this is allowed and let's continue here the thing that we can do next now that we have taken the nft inside of the sum then we can very comfortably interchange the sum and expectation since conditional expectation is linear the other reason why we can do this even though we have an infinite sum is because the thing that we have inside is non-negative these iidxis they are all greater than or equal to zero since we use them to model claim sizes so tonelli allows us to just interchange the conditional expectation and the sum and then inside here we have the conditional expectation of one so i'll just write linearity here uh, conditional expectation of this indicator multiplied by xk given n of t now the next thing we can do is notice that this indicator is just a function of n of t. So therefore, since we have conditioned on n of t, we can use the rule that is called taking out what is known. And using this rule, we can take the indicator out of the conditional expectation so i could try i could i could write the indicator here but since i'm lazy uh we just say well now i've taken the indicator out of the conditional expectations i can just plop it back up into the boundary and this is just in short the reason why we can take the sum together with the n outside of the conditional expectation okay so what i have left inside is the conditional expectation of xk given n of t now we have established the fact that we assume x independent from n so each xk is independent from n and this means that the conditional expectation of xk does not change when we condition on n so we can remove the condition and we get the mean value of xk now, one last thing that we can also notice is that x's are iid. And because they are iid, the mean value of xk is also the same as the mean value of x something else. So what we have here is the sum from 1 to n of t of the mean value of just x1. So we count. I have 1x1, 2x1, up to n of t x1. So the total number of the mean x1s that I have is n of t multiplied by the mean of x1. And this was the result that we wanted. So that was very comfortable and also relatively simple to prove. And uh, since we've done that now, we will proceed to show uh, the part where we find the conditional variance of s. And note that in this proof that we just did, we actually, you know, right down here I wrote x, k have to be i, i, d. But in fact, we only used that the x's needed to have identical distributions. Uh, I, did not, I didn't actually use that they needed to be independent. So the independence assumption um, does not need to be taken into use for this first identity to hold. However, I have to have the independence assumption for this variance identity to hold. And we will see why that is the case in just a moment. So I want to calculate the variance of the total claim amount. I can never figure out if I want to write k or i here, but I think I'll write k here. Uh, so for k from 1 to n of t, given n of t. Now, by the definition of the variance, uh, and I think we also did this as a mini exercise at one point. Well, we, we know that the conditional variance is given as the conditional second moment. So this thing squared given n of t minus the square of the conditional first moment.
Now, the second moment, we can just park that for one moment and call it star, okay? Um, and, and let us just notice that, let's call it star of t. Let's just notice that the, the conditional uh, first moment squared, well, we do know what the first moment condition on n of t uh, is. It's, it's this thing that we just found earlier. So this is just n of t squared multiplied by the mean of x1 squared. Okay, so we have that. Uh, now let's try to tackle this term that we called star of t. And it is a bit more complex than you would think. So the first thing we want to do is to take this sum that we have squared and multiply all of the terms together. And when we do that, we will get a double sum, right? And I will call that double sum something with indexes i and j. So we'll have indexes i and j running from 1 to n of t. and xi, xj here, given n of t. The next thing is to figure out which of these terms that have which properties, because we know that, uh-oh, we know that in the case where i and j are equal to each other, then, um, in the case where i and j are equal to each other, you just need to find the blackboard first here. Where, In the case where i and j are equal to each other, uh, what I will have in here is just xi multiplied by xi. So we can split this double sum up into two cases. First, the case where i and j are equal to each other, and, and there are n of t of those. Um, and in that case, I will just have xi squared inside here and given n of t. And in the second case, I will have everything where i and j are different, where I also require that i and j must both be smaller than or equal to n of t. So I have this indicator and Maybe I should start on a new line. So I will have plus the mean value of the sum where i is different from j, and i has to be smaller than or equal to n of t, and j has to be smaller than or equal to n of t, but they also have to be different. And I have xi multiplied by xj, and I also condition on n of t. Phew. Okay, so that was a lot to write down. Uh, let us look at the first term first. Here we essentially just have the same kind of construction that we had when we were calculating uh, the, 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 the mean of s of t given n of t, right? And, and we recall that whenever we have something that looks like this and the thing that's inside here, they are, well, ID and they have, uh, and they have, uh, and they are independent from the n of t. Then, then, then what we have is we have the mean of x one squared multiplied by n of t. That is what the first term evaluates to, using exactly the same logic as we used when we calculated the conditional expectation of s given n. Now, the second term is a bit more interesting. I mean, we can take the sum outside, right? Because of linearity of conditional expectations. And also, we can take this and this outside of the conditional expectation, because both are functions of n of t, and we're allowed to take out what is known. So we can take this outside, and we can take this outside. Now, what we have inside now is the mean of xi times xj given n of t. Now, we also recall that xi and xj are both independent from n of t. Uh, so 
the mean of xi multiplied by xj given n of t is just the mean of xi multiplied by xj because since this is independent from n and this is independent from n their product will also be independent from n and thus we can just remove the condition now the next thing that we have is well the first term isn't that interesting it's just the same as before however the second term is rather interesting because what I have here is the mean of xi multiplied by xj. And we recall that we have assumed that the x's are iid, and in particular, xi and xj are independent for i different from j. That means that the covariance of them is zero, and in particular, that the mean of their product is equal to the product of their means. So this is where the independence on the x's comes in. And therefore, I can write this thing into this thing. However, then I just realize again that all of the x's have the same distribution. So the mean of xi is the same as the mean of xj is the same as the mean of x1. So this term evaluates to the mean of x1, take the entire thing, squared. And how many times do I add this term upon itself inside this sum? Well, this sum lets i run up to n of t and lets j run up to n of t. However, we remove all of the terms where i is equal to j. And i is equal to j exactly n of t times. And that means that this term occurs exactly n of t squared minus n of t times. Because if I keep the diagonal where i is equal to j, then I have n of t squared elements. And then I've removed the diagonal where there are n of t elements, and thus I have so many elements left. Now you might say it almost looks more messy than when we began, but is that so? Because let us just recall what we said the variance was equal to. The variance is equal to star of t minus n of t squared multiplied by the mean squared. So let's just write this down. The variance of s of t given n of t, we wrote earlier, is equal to star of t minus n of t squared multiplied by the mean of x1 squared. Now, what have we established that star of t takes as a value? So star of t is equal to n of t multiplied by the second moment of x, and then plus this thing here, right? This thing here. However, the first term in this thing cancels out with the thing that we subtract from star of t. So that term just dies. And that's very nice because the only thing that we have left now is the second term, which is minus n of t. So the term with this and multiplied by the mean of x1 that I square. And taking n of t outside of both terms, I see that this is exactly n of t multiplied by the variance of x1. So even though these two results seem to make sense intuitively, uh, we actually still need to work a bit to acquire these two results. And this result can be acquired without assuming independence of x's, and this result definitely requires both independence of the x's and the independence of the x's and the n's in this case.